Welcome to the Life United Podcast. We are all about helping you know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. We know that today's message is going to be a blessing to you. I just want to share with you today some things that the Lord just dropped in my heart. And, and um, uh, I, got, I was just thinking about what happened on the cross and by the resurrection and realized, you know, this started in the heart of God from the very beginning of time. If you think about what we're celebrating today, what we're rejoicing in today, the risen Savior, God was thinking about this at the very beginning of time. Listen to what Romans chapter 16, verse 25 says in the Passion Translation. It says, this wonderful news includes the unveiling of the mystery kept secret from the dawn of creation until now. We're celebrating something that God had in his mind, in his heart, listen to me, from the very beginning of time. Sometimes we get trapped in our time. Sometimes we even get trapped in our time zone. And the reason I know it is because I heard all the complaining about daylight saving time. Just one little time zone. But what about, what about the dawn of creation? That this has been God's thought. This has been God's plan. This has been God's purpose from the very beginning of time. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed to us, that's you, me, the word of reconciliation. Think about that for a moment. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. All he wants is to reconcile. He's not mad. He's not angry. He wants to reconcile with every person through Jesus. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, in verse 23 and 24, and it's very interesting the way it says this. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death. Now listen to this. Him who God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. You know God had this thing figured out from the very beginning of time. Prearranged, predestined, planned ahead of time so that you and I could benefit and live a life that's different than the rest of the world. To live a resurrection life. And from that resurrection, listen to me, listen carefully. From that resurrection flows the life of God to all who will receive it. I could, you could drop me in, in the midst of the most carnal or the most anti-Christ place in the world. I want you to listen to me. And if I can communicate the gospel, somebody's going to receive it. Somebody's going to receive it. You know why? Because it's prearranged and planned, not for one person and not another, but to be available to all men. For God so loved the world, God's not willing that any should perish. And once you hear that message and allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life, it is amazing what God does with that. But He planned it from day one. He planned it from the beginning of creation that he would redeem and reconcile man to himself through Jesus. Not through Muhammad, not through Buddha, through Jesus. And Jesus is the one. That's why Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And the cross, now listen to me, the cross is where Jesus did his work for God for humanity. 
That, that's where he did his work. That's where he, that's where he came to do the work necessary for you and I. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5 says, now listen to this. I love the way it says this. It says, He has borne our grief, carried our sorrows. He bore our grief. He carried our sorrows. Now those words, grief and sorrow, are, seem to be a little you know, mild. But really, if you study those words out, it's, it's sickness and pain. We esteemed him stricken of God, smitten of God, and afflicted. But listen to this. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. He did his work. He bore all of that. He carried it to the cross. He bore it on the cross. And then he carried all that was meant for us to the grave. Nobody killed Jesus. Jesus died. Why? He had all, he carried something. And he carried it all the way to the grave. And it was meant for us, but he carried it. And he deposited it in the, in the ground, in the, in the earth, in the belly of the earth, the Bible says, in hell itself. He deposited it even as a scapegoat in the Old Testament that they put the blood for forgiveness of sins on that scapegoat and sent them out into the wilderness to never be seen again. That sin was deposited on Jesus, and Jesus literally deposited it for our sake in the earth, carrying all that was meant for us to the grave. The first part of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, listen to what it says. For, for God made the only one who did not know sin, man, I, that's amazing, isn't it? The only one who did not know sin to become sin for us. He became sin for us. That's the work of the cross. He carried it. He bore it. It was poured into him. Everything that was necessary for you to be free of sin, everything that was necessary for you to live a, a different life was poured in him. And Jesus took it. He took it all, and he breathed his last breath, and he carried that with him. Even though his body was in that grave, he carried that. The Bible said his soul was made an offering for our sin, and he literally carried that into the belly of the earth for us. He bore all the debt we could not pay. But then listen to this. The resurrection is where he gifted us with new life, born from the affliction of the cross and the finality of the grave. See, there was no reason Jesus should be raised from the dead from a natural standpoint. He was dead. You know, when you're dead, you're dead. Well, Jesus proved that not to be true, and we're going to look at that in a minute. But the point is, listen to me, but that was a, fin that was a final, final act under an old system, under an old way of life, under an old way of living. Even at its best, the old way couldn't do anything compared to what God wanted to do because of the resurrection. And the resurrection is where God gifted us with that new life. Listen to the last part of 2 Corinthians 5.21. For we who did not know righteousness might become the righteousness of God through our union with Jesus. He did something through that resurrection that could only be done one way, and that was because he took the sin and he deposited it. He got rid of it. The Bible says it was nailed to the cross. Everything that was against you, every trespass against you was nailed to the cross. 
And then Jesus himself died the death that you deserve to die for that sin and deposited it where it would never, ever be your, under, your, under control uh, again of the devil. Listen to this. It says that God gave us a righteousness through our union with Jesus. I love what the Amplified Bible says. It says, an approved and acceptable right relationship with Him by His goodness. Approved, acceptable, right relationship with Him by His goodness. God said, I'm going to turn this thing around, and I'm going to turn it around in three days. I'm going to turn it around in three days. Throughout all of history, all, uh, all of the, the, the millenniums, all of the, of the decades, all of the, all of the hours, all of the minutes, God said, I'm going to change everything in three days because I'm going to let my son bear the sin that, that humanity was supposed to bear, and I'm going to raise up human, humanity. And if they will accept my son, then they're going to be approved and acceptable and in right relationship with me because of my goodness. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this in the New Living Translation. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. Do you understand that Jesus had a new life? Do you understand that when Jesus came in the earth, that he, he took on a body just like you? Do you know he still has a body? Do you know he is forever and ever identified with us? Because he's like us. That's why he's our great high priest, seated at the right hand of the Father. Because he's like us, because he identifies with us. He ever lives, the Bible says, to make intercession for us. So anyone who belongs to Christ, they become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Now I have a new resurrection life through Jesus. And this new person has been created for me. Now, here's what you got to hear. Okay, Now, listen to me carefully, because this is what I really want to address today. Okay, I think if you have any ideas about Christianity, you know what I just said. Most of it you know. But here's the, here's the rub, so to speak, or here's, here's the question. Now I have a, a new resurrection life through Jesus, this new person that God has created me to be. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm new. But here's the thing. I'm not yet a perfect person, but a person in progress. But God yet sees me as that perfect person. Now, I cannot explain that to you. How a screw-up like Sam Carr can be standing here today communicating the gospel to you as an imperfect person. And yet God honors that and honors that word and literally honors me. He actually lets me come into his throne. I don't have to say, now, Lord, you know how bad I am, but would you just kind of let me just kind of climb in the corner somewhere? He says, come boldly into the throne of grace. Why? Because he sees me different. Okay, he sees me different. Because that perfection that we, that we want and that we desire has not been realized yet. Not the fullness of it. Now listen, when I got saved, I became a new creature in Christ. I'm going to say probably about 75% of, of my bad stuff fell off. It's that other 25% I got, I've been working on ever since. You know... I didn't smoke anymore. I didn't drink anymore. I didn't 
do drugs anymore. I didn't do any of that kind of stuff anymore. I lived a, a right life and served God. But, but there's always something. Don't look at me so holy. <laughs> there's always something that we're working on. Always something. And, and if you're not working on something, then you're in trouble. Listen to what the great apostle Paul said. Now, you know, if anybody had been holy, this man would have been holy. I mean, anybody could get up being married and having a wife and say, I, it's better. There's something wrong with that guy. <laughs> I'm glad he made a statement and said, not everybody here called to this. And I went, thank God, I'm not. But he lived a life of, of fullness that, that was Amazing, but listen to what he said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. Listen to this. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but here's the big, here's the big reveal right here. I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. In other words, what Jesus did for us was perfect. And it brings a perfection. And we will know that perfection one day. You won't know it while you're in this earthly body. But you'll know that perfection one day. Because the resurrection guarantees it. That empty tomb guarantees my perfection. But see, Paul said, hey, I'm not there yet. <clears throat> I haven't been, I'm not, I hadn't reached it yet. I, 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 I know that resurrection provided it, but I hadn't, I hadn't got it yet. I got some of it. I'm that new creature in Christ. All this stuff fell off. I, hey, I'm a, I just got to tell you, I'm a lot better today. And that's not bragging, it's just fact. I'm a lot better today than I was 30 years ago. I'm a different person. And I hope I'm growing, and I hope I'm going to be growing till I take my last breath because I'm pushing toward that same place that Paul was talking about. The resurrection guarantees that perfection, that it's coming, uh, and we're going to stand before God, and He's going to look at us in a different way than you and I ever imagined. But I want you to listen to me today because I want to focus on the resurrection life Jesus provided for us. And I'm going to use this as an example because in the New Testament, there are two resurrections that, that, that I want to look at. The first one is Jesus. Now, I'm not going to tell the whole story of the resurrection and, and all the things that happened. I just want to pick out just one part of it. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, and, it, and she looked inside. The stone had been rolled away, and when she looked inside, Jesus was gone. Now, she thought somebody would stolen him. So she went and told Peter, and I believe John, about it. So Peter and John took off to the, to the tomb. And so when they got there, I want you to listen to what it says in John chapter 20, beginning at verse 4. So they both ran together, and the other disciple, that's John, I believe, outran Peter and came to the tomb first. He, stooping down and looking in, now listen to this, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. I don't know why he didn't go in. I would have had to have gone in. I mean, to think about looking in there, knowing that that's where Jesus was, and there are the linen cloths, and look in there and not go in? I want to know what he thought. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, 
and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linens, clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. Now, I'm going to stop right there. When they came to that tomb, they saw something. They saw the clothes that Jesus wore. Now, you know, um, they, they, there's a big, uh, it, it tours all the time. It's called the Shroud of Turin. And, and they think it was the, the clothing that Jesus wore. I don't know whether it was or not. Personally, I don't think it was because I think if it was, there'd be so much healing power in that thing that if you came around it, you couldn't stand any, you, you'd, be, you'd receive anything you needed. Emanating from a resurrection. Are you kidding me? Now, I may be wrong, but the point is, listen, the point is when Jesus was raised from the dead, he didn't wear those clothes anymore. He wasn't naked. He had on different clothes. He had glorified clothes. Where'd they come from? From God. And you and I don't understand that, and we won't understand that until we get to heaven to realize how that works. But right there in that tomb, were all of the earthly clothes that Jesus ever wore. He never took any of that with him to heaven. It was all right there on the, in the earth. It was all right there, laying, laying there. He came out of that grave clean from all the brutality of the cross, save for the scars in his hands and the scar in his side. The total perfection that God accepts us with through the righteousness of the resurrection. That's it. Purity. Total purity. Nothing, nothing resembling death. He left it in that tomb. There was nothing else. That's, that's the perfection. In fact, Mary saw Jesus and, and, and fell at his feet. And, and Jesus said, don't touch me. I've not ascended to my father yet. Because he was on his way to take that blood before the mercy seat of God. Totally pure. Total perfection. The total perfection that God accepts us with through that righteousness of that resurrection. Listen to Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. And I'm going to read verses 21 and 22 together, and then I want you to listen to this. Even though... You were once distant from him, living in the shadows of your evil thoughts and actions. He reconciled you back to himself. He released the supernatural peace to you through the sacrifice of his own body and the sin payment on your behalf so that you would dwell in his presence. Now listen to this. So that you would dwell in his presence. And now there is nothing between you and the Father God, for he sees you flawless and restored. Glory. Nothing between you and God. He sees you flawless and restored. Now, now listen, because here's where we struggle. Listen to the next verse. If indeed you continue to advance in the faith, assured of a foundation, a firm foundation to grow upon, never be shaken from the hope of the gospel you believed in. All right, listen to me. Did you hear what it said? On one hand, you're hearing God sees us flawless and restored. And on the other hand, it's our responsibility to continue to advance in the faith. What does that look like? What does that mean? What does that mean? Let's look at another resurrection. It's the resurrection of Lazarus. Actually, Lazarus was in the grave, if you count it, longer than Jesus was. Uh, he didn't raise himself either, by the way. But I want you to listen to this because Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus. They moved the stone away, and he called out, and he said, Lazarus, come forth. 
And the next thing we know, here comes a, 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 a man, and I'm going to read this to you. In verse 44 of Luke chapter 11, it says, He who had died came out. But now listen to this. Bound hand and foot with grave clothes. His face was still wrapped with a cloth. Here's what Jesus said. Listen, loose him and let him go. Now, can you see the difference between Jesus' resurrection? When, when Lazarus was resurrected, he still had the grave clothes on. He still had those clothes that he was wrapped in at his death. And when he was literally put back in his body and his body was re-energized and life came back into it, listen to me, he still had the grave clothes. He still was wearing those stinking grave clothes that represent the earth and, and the, the life on the earth and how the life on the earth is lived. Lazarus represents that natural man we fight every day. Still bound with grave clothes after the resurrection. We have to take those clothes off. See, way too many Christians just want to live with their grave clothes on. They want to live like everybody else. When Jesus gave us a new life, a new way of living, we don't have to live the old way. The first thing Jesus said was take those stinking grave clothes off of him. He didn't even have a way to take them off himself. But we have to take off our grave clothes. That's our responsibility. God looks at us in an amazing way. How does he do that? It's called love. He sees us through the blood of Jesus, and he sees us flawless, but yet we live on this earth trying to press into perfection and to be what God wants us to be, which is right, not wrong. But it's our responsibility to take off those stinking grave clothes and not be identified as those who are still living a dead grave life. See, listen, you're dead whether you know it or not. You're either dead in Christ or you're dead in your sins. So you've got to make up your mind, am I going to, am I going to be dead in my sins and wear these grave clothes or am I going to break out of them? Let me show you this in, in, in the Apostle Paul's life again. This, this, to me, spells it out because if anybody had it, and got it, it was Paul, because he wrote it. But listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, <coughs> excuse me, in verse 27. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Can you imagine that this man wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, lived as, uh, under the, the righteousness of God in Christ? He said over in Galatians chapter 2, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He said, yeah, but I've got to fight it every day. I've got to take those grave clothes off every day. That's why he said, I'm not perfect, but I'm pushing. I'm pushing. I want to be what God wants me to be. I want to live the life God has for me, that resurrection life that frees me from the bonds of all the sin and all the garbage that the world has to offer. We've got way too many people walking around in grave clothes. Now, I'm not trying to condemn you today. I'm trying to wake you up and realize you don't have to. You don't have to. Listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 4. This will, this will give you a clear understanding of it. You ready? Listen to what it says. Put off concerning your former conduct, the old man. The one that you used to be 
before Jesus raised you from the dead. You have to put off that conduct. The old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. Now listen to this. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now listen to this. You ready? And put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Do you understand your responsibility as a believer? Do you understand that the reality of, of how we live our lives is not, well, we're just going to make it till Jesus comes back, that our life should be a constant pushing toward perfection, living the life God wants us to live, laying aside the things that we have no business being involved in, living a life of fullness in Him and letting Him be our lead, letting Him be our guide, letting Him uh, instruct us through His Word every day and that we judge ourselves every day. This is the process of life as a believer. Jesus came out of that grave. There were no clothes. No, nothing worldly did He take with Him. But yet we're wrapped up in, in grave clothes. And we want to justify our lives. Or we want to find a scripture that tells us we can. Well, you know, we're saved by grace. God loves us. It don't matter what we do. Yeah, but that's not life. That's not resurrection life. That's not what God has for us. That's not the way he wants us to live our lives and to fulfill our lives. We ought to be ever moving forward in the things of the kingdom, never allowing that old life to rise up and take hold of us again. Hey, the temptation's there every day. I don't care how long you've been serving God. You're not sanctified enough to think that that old life can't draw you or something can tempt you away from what God wants you to. To be. And you have, you have, listen, I know this sounds kind of harsh, but listen, you have no right to justify that you can do that. Because you, you have to see what God did for you to free you from that. And you have to live the life He has for you. And here's the good news we have the help of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit, Romans 8 11, the same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, dwells in us. Who I am so glad I have the Holy Spirit to help me. I, have so, I am so glad that I don't have to do this in my own strength. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. And that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead that lives in me, listen to this, will make alive my mortal body through the Spirit who dwells in me. He's there to work with me, to walk in that new man, to walk in that resurrection man instead of that old man, that dead man, that man that Lazarus represented. Because he died again. Lazarus died again. Listen to what Paul said in, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. That I may know him... And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. Now listen to this next verse. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. He was after it. He was after it. He hadn't attained. I haven't attained. But listen. Listen. Our responsibility is to live a resurrection life. And that resurrection life is constantly shedding those old grave clothes so that we can walk in love, that we can walk in His power. We can walk in the freedom that He gives us and the liberty that He gives us in our lives. When you compare, listen to this, I'm just about finished, but listen. When you compare what Jesus did to transform us if you compare that with our responsibility to the resurrection, what we have to do is minuscule. It, it, it ought to be a passion. 1 Corinthians 
chapter 1, verse 23 says this in the message translation. You don't walk away from a gift like that, the resurrection. You don't walk away from that. You stay grounded and steady in the bond of trust, constantly tuned into the message, careful not to be distracted or diverted. That's how we're to live our lives. That's the resurrection life that we have to live. Take the challenge today from the Word of God. Take off the grave clothes. Live the life He has for you. Quit, quit playing, playing church if you are. Quit, quit justifying why you don't have to do this and you can do what you want to do and you can do this. Listen, that's not the way we live our lives. We put off the old and we put on the new. We renew our minds. And I like the Ephesians says the spirit of our minds, the attitude of our mind, how we think, what we think. And once you make up your mind to do that, the life that you live becomes so much brighter, so much clearer, because you don't hold animosity toward anybody. You walk in forgiveness toward everybody. You walk in love. You think the best of other people instead of always thinking the worst. All of a sudden, your life just gets brighter. It just explodes with light when you live His life, that resurrection life that doesn't have any grave clothes. And once you take a step or two in that direction and you start seeing how free you become, you know, I, I know this sounds, and I'm going to finish with this, and it's such a foolish thing, but I want to tell you anyway because it, it really got me today. I was up early this morning, way before daylight, and, and uh, we have a swimming pool at our house that somebody built for us many years ago, and, and they built it, but I have to take care of it. <laughs> and, and I'm out there, and that's Easter morning, okay? I'm out there walking outside, and I'm walking around that pool. Well, we've been having trouble with it, and, and we hadn't been able to to run the pump on it and it looks nasty and it's and I can't get them to come out and fix it and not, just want to show you and 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 I'm I'm supposed to be praying over you and I'm walking around that nasty pool and I'm mad <laughs> because they said they were gonna be out ten days ago. Then they said they're gonna be out last week. And I, I mean, all of a sudden I'm thinking, well, this is what I'm going to do. Monday morning, I'm going to call in. <laughs> all of a sudden, thank God for the Holy Spirit. He started dealing with me. Cast all your care over on me. Don't be anxious for anything. You know, immediately I realized, you know what? I'm trying to preach about taking grave clothes off and I got them on and I'm about to fall in this pool I'm so <laughs> and I had to stop and I said Lord I just cast this over on you right now I thank you for you working it out you doing what's necessary to get this thing fixed I'm not going to fret about it I'm not going to worry about it I'm casting the care of it over on you that is a resurrection life I'm telling you, a freedom came on the inside of me. I know that sounds silly, but I dare say we all are confronted with stuff like that all the time. <laughs> but how do you respond? What kind of life do you really want for yourself? A lot of times we're so used to living with grave clothes on, we think it's better. Well, it's not. It's not. It's better to live a resurrection life and let God work supernaturally in our lives every day of our lives. Put off those old clothes. And really, that's that word put off, if you study in the Greek, literally means to take off your old clothes. Take off something. And put on that new man that was resurrected through Jesus. That's how He wants us to live our lives every day. 
Would you bow your heads with me, please? We have people here on many different levels and in their Christian walk, and, and and we all have things we deal with. So please don't misunderstand this. It's perfection is not has not been reached by anybody anywhere near. So just so you understand that. But yet I want to challenge you today to step up, move forward, move out, and let God do something amazing in your life. You'll live a free life, no offense. You'll live a life of joy, a life of peace. But if you're here this morning, maybe you came with someone, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Or maybe you're here today and you've been distracted, according to the Word of God, and diverted, and you, you've been living basically the life you want to live, which are grave clothes lives. And you say today, Pastor, I'm going to get out of these grave clothes. While your head's bowed and your eyes are closed, I'm going to pray with you right where you are. But, but just as an act of your faith this morning, if you say, Pastor, that's me. I've never made Jesus my Lord, or I've got to get rid of these grave clothes. I've got to live the life God wants for me. Either one of them, just as an act of your faith, while every head's bowed and every eye's closed, just lift your hand up just quickly and say, that's me. Pray for me. Lift them up. You can put them back down. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you all over the... Thank you. Thank you in the back. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Anyone else? You know, the greatest thing about our, our God, our Father, is woven into this resurrection is an amazing thing. First of all, all you have to do to take that first step is to pray and make Jesus the Lord of your life. But the other side is even if you have been serving God and you get into sin, He said, if you'll just confess it, I'll forgive you. It's woven right in. So I'm going to ask everyone to pray this prayer with me today, and we're going to help those that lifted their hand. So just pray this with me today. Say, Father, thank you for your son Jesus who died to carry my sins that I might be free, who was raised from the dead to give me liberty, to give me freedom. I choose Jesus as my Lord, as my Savior, and I thank you that you forgive me of my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for connecting with us today on the podcast. And you know, we'd love to connect with you in person at one of our campuses in Shreveport, Louisiana, or in Lake Charles, Louisiana. You can get all the information from our website, lifeunited.church.